coming in. I'm sure here in New York, New York is a very special place, and this is a very special time. <laughs> no, it is. New York is a, is, a, is a city that is very, very powerful in, in its potential to change the world. Y'all need to get back with Harlem, okay? We need to get that back. But, but aside from that, let's, let's look at what, ex, what you experience. And the reason why I'm saying this is an interesting thing, because you notice how many children go missing and stuff like that? Or you know how many uh, pedophiles show up all of a sudden? They the teacher, they the gym coach, they the all these folks. You notice how that's kind of happening a lot? Right. And you know what? You know the Dahmers are showing up. Gacy, you know, cutting up the bodies, putting them under. You know, you notice how all these folks kind of, you also know what they look like, right? OK, but all right, just stay with me. <laughs> stay with me. Can you imagine those people who know socially this is, in a, this is deviant behavior? It does not meet with the norm, right? This is something that is taboo. But you see, during slavery, you didn't have to worry about that upsetting the social order, now did you? You didn't have to be questioned on your moral conduct because you could buy your pathology. You could buy it at two. And you could do what you wanted with it for as long as you wanted to, any time you wanted to, with absolute impunity. There was nothing to be done. You could buy what you wanted. And we don't want to think about that sick, maniacal person that bought it. But you know they did. You know they did. But we don't mention them. We talk about the happy master. They gave the happy slaves nice quarters and treated them kindly. That's what we talk about. And yet we see a pervasive, pervasive number of those people that are doing that now. They did it then. But then some of you may say, well, I don't know. Is that written somewhere, Joy? <laughs> so let's go to what is written. There are a couple of books if you want. You know, so many people, I, I, it's interesting how we get, get <coughs> hung up on things. You know, people have questioned the, the Willie Lynch story. I don't care. You can question it if you like. Maybe throw it out if you want. Get 100 Years of Lynching, the book, and you get the newspaper accounts. It makes uh, Willie Lynch look silly. OK? And if you want the pictorial, you know, without sanctuary. It's not table reading, but if you want to see it, it's there. OK, so we don't have to worry about whether the people want to substantiate it, because you know that's the first thing they do. And they find someone that's, that's black, too, unsubstantiated, by the way. But let's look at what, what the law said. It is a book called Southern Slavery and the Law. And the one thing that's very important about this uh, is written by a man named Thomas. Last name is Thomas. Southern slavery and the law. What's interesting about this is the opening chapter talks about the preoccupation with the, the black male penis size. You know how we keep talking about the myth and this and all that? Their whole first chapter devoted to the preoccupation with the male genitalia, which may explain why shortly after being lynched, they were castrated. But let's look at what the law says. And if any slave resists his master or owner or other person by his or her order correcting such slave and shall be happened to, to be killed in such correction, it shall not be accounted felony. But the master, owner, and every other such person so giving correction shall be acquit of all punishment and accusation for the same as if such accident had never happened. That's called the Casual Killing Act. That means if you happen to be beating your slave and you beat him to death, it couldn't be considered a felony. It was simply an accident while correcting the slave. And that sounds like painfully familiar to us around excessive use of force, right? And we start looking at the appropriate use of force and how many of us end up dead because that was the amount of force that they needed to correct. But let's look at this even closer. Why would you beat a slave to death? Well, you couldn't find him because they had no money. You didn't want them to get jailed because then their labor is lost to you. So you must beat them severely in order for them to submit to you. Thus, slavery in, inherent in the process was violence, you see. And they say, we're violent. But who pushed whom first? So let's look at another aspect. Those of you that uh, understand that everything we do, we, we tend to pathologize. So how many of you are familiar with J. Marion Sims? 
J. Marion Sims, how many women in the audience know what a vaginal speculum is? Okay. So I bet you the went, brothers, that we lost you on that. It's a, um, it's an instrument that is used to peer into the vagina. It was created by this J. Marion Sims. He was credited to this day as being the wealthiest physician to have ever lived, given that. So let's read about what he did. J. Marion Sims was a physician in the mid-1800s who was credited with the creation of the first vaginal speculum, which was made from a pewter spoon. Sims had built a makeshift hospital in his backyard where he conducted surgical experiments on unanesthetized African slave women. Sims reasoned that slave women were able to bear great pain because their race made them more durable and thus they were well suited for painful medical experimentation. Because you know, Thomas Jefferson said we felt less pain, we didn't need sleep, and we didn't feel grief. That's really convenient, isn't it? So now we understand, well, how did they get these women? Where, where did these women come from that Sims got? So now let's go back and take a look. Well, they were brought to Sims, and they, the people would complain. Each one of these slave masters would bring these women in, and they'd say, this young woman here is not fit for duty. And Sims would, would look at these women, and indeed, they suffered from something called a vaginal fistula. You might have heard about this. Oprah talked about it. The woman on there was talking about a vaginal fistula. And a vaginal fistula often occurs during childbearing when a woman will tear so deeply that it will tear through the urinary tract and, and the bladder. And in fact, you will have feces and urine that will drip through uncontrollably. It does heal, but it smells and it's very uncomfortable and it's, it's really a horrible state for women, uh, largely due to the, the smelliness of it. But if you are, in fact, one of those women that have a vaginal fistula, can you still work the fields? Sure you can. You can work the fields. You'll be smelly. You may be uncomfortable, but you can work the fields. Can you sweep and clean in the house? Can you feed the animals? Well, then what makes her, J. Marion Sims, unfit for duty? I need to have sexual access to her. So you need to fix her so that I can do her because that is her duty to me. Okay, so this is why they came to J. Marion Sims. And let's take a look at why they thought this was all okay. And it, it has to do with pathologizing race. You see, because by pathologizing race, making race a sick thing, then you therefore justify your behavior to remove the cognitive... Yes, you're listening. That's right. You got to remove that dissonance. So now, their first pathological symptom was their primary racial characteristic, their skin color. In a w medical world that categorized life as either normal or pathological, which is dichotomous thinking, people of the African diaspora were continually condemned to the category of pathological, their abnormal skin color serving as a foil for normal white skin. Pathological causes for this condition were concocted in order to explain its prevalence. In other words, how come there's so many of these black people if it's a pathological thing? Here is what they, the favorite theory that ar arose out of the scientific medical journals. These people, the skin color and attendant physiognomy of the black are the result of congenital leprosy. <laughs> they decided that's what's wrong. If you're black out there, you got congenital leprosy. That's why you're black. Such medical arguments in collusion with racist and stereotypic scientific and cultural explanations provided the grounds for differential treatment. Now, second pathological symptom. The second symptom was gender. Black females who per were perceived to be irreligious, lustful, and immoderate. Well, my God, that is really convenient. Here is the proof. Their protruding buttocks and genitals were offered as physical evidence of their pathology. Anybody with a big butt? <laughs> then it gets a little deeper. This is one where I just really had to, I couldn't believe this one. And some people have heard about this particular symptom. Samuel Cartwright argued, this was a 19th century physician, that two particular forms of mental illness caused by nerve disorders were prevalent among slaves. One was drapedomania, 
which was diagnosable by one single symptom, the uncontrollable urge to escape from slavery. <laughs> they pathologized not wanting to be a slave. Pathologizing. Then there was a second one, Dysethesia aethiopica, which revealed many symptoms, destroying property on the plantation, <laughs> being disobedient and talking back. <laughs> what I'm saying here is that you have to pathologize. We're talking about journals have been written about this, all to justify the behavior of what they did to remove the dissonance. So more seriously, when we begin to look at the nature of the injury, y'all are all afraid. But I want you to take a look at what happened and what I mean by transgenerational impact. Transgenerational, moving along a continuum, generational trauma. If you are a slave mother and you are a good mother, you are going to prepare your children for adulthood, yes? yes? In every society, there had been something called rites of passage, which is movement from your childhood into adult meaningful work and support of the clan. Rites of passage. We have now adopted the term adolescence, which is a European term, by the way, it was developed in Europe which now gives young people permission to lose their minds. <laughs> we just say, oh yeah, they're adolescent, not in my house. I guess they just didn't get to be adolescent in my house. <laughs> but we did then be give, began to give them permission to be insane during that period. But before that, we had rites of passage. And if I'm a slave mother and I'm a good mother, I am going to prepare my daughter to be raped. Come on now, I'm not gonna let my little girl walk into that blind, am I? Not as a good mother, I wouldn't do that to her, so I'm gonna say, baby, and I'm not gonna wait till she's 18, assuming it's gonna start then. I gotta pull her out at, oh, eight, nine, and 10, and say, baby, here is what's going to happen to you. Here is what he may or may not do to you, and, and this is what you might wanna do to make it hurt less, and baby, don't scream, because it may make it worse for you. And baby, they come, and I don't know if it's gonna be one or two, or a group of them, and I don't know how many times, but surely they are coming, baby. This is what they will do to you. If I'm a good mother, I will prepare my daughter for pathology. And when that night comes, when they come to wrestle her away, her father stands next to me, helpless, as she begs him to help her. But y'all are free. Good afternoon. Um, as many of you well know, this is 30 Frames a Second, and I am Nat Wood. Um, that was Dr. Joy Degree. Um, she wrote the book um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, and today we have uh, two guests. We have my favorite guest. That's Coley Clark. Uh, we had scheduled someone else, and, and Coley, uh, uh, God made Coley call me. <laughs> and so Coley is here today because she wants to talk about an event that they're having at Riverside Church uh, two days from now, um, April 4th at 7 p.m. Um, as it is, um, my original guest kind of like canceled. He had some personal problems, which was kind of good because the stuff that he kind of uh, speaks about is, um, is old thinking. And Coley is, is a uh, very young, very bribe, uh, vibrant in the way she thinks and the way she sees things and, and, and she uh, adjusts her thinking to an ever-changing paradigm. So it's good because that's basically our mission here. Um, the event that uh, they're going to talk about is, um, it's called, let me, let me get it right, uh, Honoring the Radical MLK. It's, it's honoring Dr. King um, at a special event. It's at the Riverside Church. It'll be on Thursday, April 4th at 7 p.m. Um, at uh, the Riverside Church, which is 490 Riverside Drive between uh, 120th and 122nd Street. It's a lot of church. Um, and uh, Coley has been kind enough to bring with us the, uh, the, organizer, the, the, um, the organizer of the event, uh, Dr. Johanna uh, Fernandez. Um, she's a professor um, at Baruch. And uh, I expect that this is going to be one knockdown, uh, drag out, 
uh, beautiful show. And with that, if you guys have my opening, we're going to run that opening. And when they get through running that opening, we will be back with Coley Clark and Professor J. and the perpetrator is now the victim. Mm -hmm. And that just drives me um, crazy. And we are back. Um, as I said before, I have uh, with me today uh, uh, the one, the only, the inimitable uh, Coley <laughs> Clark and Professor Johanna Fernandez. And they're going to tell us about an event that's coming up at Riverside Church. And uh, with that, I'm going to leave it to either one of you ladies who wants to chime in first. As you know, sometimes I am somewhat less than accurate, and they're going to make sure that I am uh, no, totally no, 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 accurate no, no, no. because we do not want to misinform anyone. Um, Don't let him fool you, New York. <laughs> Don't let him do that to you. <laughs> this man is not only accurate. He does serious research before every show. I wish I had his talents and skills, especially the camera skills. He is the best Nat, uh, seven degrees of separation. We love you, brother. Thank you, sister. I love you, too. Now, the event that we are referring to, and Johanna's going to do a lot of talking today. I'm going to be one of the activists that's being featured for this event, even though I have worked on the committee with Johanna. Very pleased to work with this brilliant young woman who is also, uh, uh, how should you say, the chairperson of Educators for Mumia Abu-Jamal, the campaign to get Mumia out in four of course, we've been saying, I tell her all the time, we're going to liberate them this summer. <laughs> I mean it. Um, well, she will be doing a lot of discussion about mm -hmm. how the program was formed. She called me to give me an invite, the other members of the committee. But 45 years ago, this Thursday, a brother whose journey begun in 1955 at Montgomery, Alabama, took that giant leap into human history and followed the road of the cross. And that was the road of the cross for Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. A journey of 13 long, difficult, trying, but very meaningful years. So we're going to be talking about Dr. King mm. today, about his radical legacy, because there's a tendency to see Dr. King and somehow, because he represented a nonviolent movement mm -hmm. as being soft and gentle and kind, and he was <laughs> soft and gentle and kind, but the movement that he represented challenged the very core of the U.S. in law and in human rights. Mm -hmm. And that's what we will be doing on this Thursday. There will be a storytelling section. Johanna will get into to that and into it all. But I'm from the storytelling section, and I will be letting the lie that I live, New York, speak for me, oh. along with David Dennis and a whole lot of other folks from, from the original movement. I'm so pleased and so happy. Thank you, Johanna, for inviting me. Oh, thank you uh, so much for those powerful words. I think we should uh, probably start by saying that it takes a village mm. to uh, build a movement. And a village has contributed to the organizing of this event. Uh, Carol Nixon, uh, who's the director of uh, the justice programs at the church, uh, presided over this event alongside of um, Reverend Bob Coleman, mm -hmm. who's also uh, the chief minister involved in um, these justice programs at the church. There are others who were involved, including uh, Nellie Bailey uh, and Jane Feldman. And as Sister Colia mentioned, this program is really about honoring the radical king. And as Sister Colia reminded me, that legacy of radicalism, contrary to popular belief, really began in Montgomery mm. when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King decided to commit himself and wed himself to uh, this uh, emerging movement. 
Now, why was the Montgomery bus boycott a radical departure uh, in the movement? It was at that moment that a strategy developed within the civil rights movement, which began really much earlier during World War II uh, and was quieted because of the Red Scare. But at Montgomery, the Martin Red Luther King, being communism, communism, the Joe right. McCarthy movement to paint everybody right. as a communist, as a communist in the and anti-American. So in Montgomery, uh, C. D. Nixon, Reverend C. D. Nixon, uh, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, decide that the struggle for Black freedom must take place through mass action in the streets. Mm -hmm. That was a departure from the NAACP's strategy, which was uh, predominantly a legal one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with this movement into the streets of the civil rights movement, you have uh, a flowering of ideas that leads inevitably to 1967, which is uh, the moment that is being commemorated at this event, mm -hmm. and that is uh, Martin Luther King's now famous Beyond Vietnam speech, mm -hmm. in which he took a public position against the Vietnam War, and that had a transformative impact on the consciousness of this nation around the war. Uh, but the consciousness of the world around uh, the Vietnam War. And so our task on April 4th, uh, 2013, at the Riverside Church at 7 p.m., is to really celebrate the king that we have forgotten mm -hmm. or that mainstream discourse uh, has forgotten in this country. Because Sister Colia work worked alongside of MLK, Dr. Right. Martin Luther King, right. and she remembers. And Medgar. And Medgar Evers. Oh, Medgar, yes. Yeah. And this is his 50th anniver anniversary yeah. of his killing. Yeah. And so, you know, this year is a hot year for me. But yeah, we know, Johanna, what happens is, is that what Dr. King did when he came to Riverside, and he says it in such, in such a wonderful way as only he could say it, is that the, for two years he'd been kind of molding over in his mind this whole question of Vietnam. Malcolm had come out in 63. Mm -hmm. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee mm -hmm. had come out mm -hmm. in 63. Mm -hmm. His wife, Coretta Scott King, mm -hmm. had taken a position on Vietnam in 63. But Dr. King had been quiet. So for two years, and he says for two years he molded over it, but there comes a time, I'm quoting him, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Right. This right. is the same man that says to right. us, uh, if we don't have a reason for which to die, right. you don't have no reason for living. Right. So he takes another giant leap, right. the giant leap at Montgomery because a young girl, a young 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin, mm -hmm. took a seat in front of Dexter Avenue Baptist, which, by the way, folks, is located over a slave stall. There's a lot of mystical stuff going on here. 15-year-old girl takes a bus seat and refuses to get up. Uh, E.D. Nixon mm -hmm. from the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and right. the president of NHP right. at Montgomery, uh, and also probably the impetus for what would become the major organization for that movement in mm -hmm. Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately rushes out there, three days of mass meetings, uh, and Dr. King has to be looking and listening. Looking and listening. This mm -hmm. is March the 2nd, 1955, when that child takes a seat. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a time when he is, as he said he was molded over Vietnam, <laughs> molded over Vietnam two years. He didn't get two years on this one, uh, but he had a lifetime of experience. Had we all? He was 26 years old. Right. Uh, very young. Right. Uh, a genius. No, but no, no uh, doubt a genius. Uh, 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 academically, he was uh, uh, extraordinary. He was a novelty right. from, from Montgomery, was, Alabama. Right. He was a novelty for New York and Connecticut. <laughs> 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 a 15-year-old who goes to college, but by the time he gets to Crozier Theological Seminary, right. He is quite a young man. He's right. up about more 21, two years old. Right. And he's coming back to Montgomery where the most preachers, and we have a, we, we have a, in, in the South, we, we, we love education. Mm -hmm. We've been mm -hmm. denied, denied access. But he came back with a Doctors of Divinity from Crozer Theological Seminary, uh, <laughs> Boston mm -hmm. University. 
Man. Boston College or something. Man. And black folk are like, wow, he went up there. He didn't go to the black Bible school like Reverend Abernathy, Man. which was right next door. Now, that's all Man. right, too, folks. Do not play down the black Bible school because all of these men made great contributions. But Man. Dr. King became our special person in the Man. house. Man. Young, beautiful young wife. Man. Right, and right, he showed up on the right, scene, 26, which means right. he's going to be with us a long time. I'm thinking through the eyes now of the Women's Political Council right. because it's a women's political, it's a young girl, 15, and it's a women's political council, which right. has spent 10 years right. trying to select somebody who can file a suit against the city of Montgomery mm -hmm. for ending bus segregation mm -hmm. in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And it's been, this has been going on. I mean, mm -hmm. and there's some great women involved. Susan McDonald, who is on the case with Claudette Colvin, because there are two things at Montgomery. There's the boycott and there is the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the lawsuit in the name of Amelia P. Browder, who was 42 years old, is Susan McDonald, who was 72 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of her, 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 her uh, Nephews, it was a judge out here in Long Island. He was with us at Montgomery in 1990 when we brought home Claudette Colvin for the first time mm -hmm. in 35 mm -hmm. years. Wow. Ain't that something? Wow. And Governor Cuomo was nice. Wow. He gave our Freedom Award, the wow. New York Highs Award, the Martin Luther King Award for six unsung herons mm -hmm. at Montgomery. Mm -hmm. But my point here is, is that these women then began to move. Mm -hmm. And there began to be a steering. Three days of mass meetings, and they didn't select the girl. And the girl just mm. had a lot of crisis because right. it was father. She lives here in New York. Right. She works for 1199C. She's a year older than I am. Mm. Oh, she's a wonderful, powerful woman, Claudette. But she caught hold of hell on all ends mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that summer mm -hmm. she got pregnant. And in the South where I come from, you don't get pregnant. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, don't get yeah. pregnant, ladies. Uh, as a teenager, you don't get pregnant as a woman. Yeah. Unless you're married. So we and I know you know about this mm -hmm. from, from oh, coming yeah. out of yeah. the Dominican yeah. Republic yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, this is was a novelty. So we lose a young girl in one sense, but it's a great moment because she sits down March the second. Emmett Till is killed in Mississippi, brutally lynched. Yeah. On August think, the thirtieth. It's, 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 it's a big year, fifty five. Fifty five is a big year, brother. Not understatement. And then so she's nine months prior to Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. who chaired the youth council in which she was a member. Yeah. And then two months, uh, which would be the seventh month, you know, yeah. take nine months to get a baby. Yeah. But you can get trouble in the seventh yeah. month, because in the seventh month, Mary Louise Smith, a yeah. uh, 16-year-old, yeah. decided she'd take a seat. And Claudette was the quiet type, even though she fought and sent the policeman to, jail, to, to the, one to the hospital, one took mm -hmm. her in the youth court. This little girl was tough, because she would later desegregate the why, the white why. Right. At, at right. Montgomery, and she told me when, it, when, right. we, when I talked with her in 1990, uh, she said, I'll fight any place, anywhere, right. anytime. I ain't taking nothing right. until I'm free. So you can get the spirit of these young women. So she sets in, and then on December 1, we get Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. So the, the two young mm -hmm. girls and the two older women are on the lawsuit. Uh, the two young girls are there in the name of their parent because they were juveniles. Mm -hmm. But it's the lawsuit that Dr. King, when he walked into the church, and you see him in the film for people, and he says, well, I want you all to vote tonight mm -hmm. as to whether or not we want to call off the boycott because the lawsuit has been won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the two play hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Lawsuit and boycott, so we get a legal decision mm -hmm. and a boycott, and this is where we get the road to the cross. Right because Dr. King's house was already being bombed. Right. E.D. Nixon's house was bombed twice with his mm -hmm. wife in it. Right. So the bombings are taking place, the killings are taking place, the beatings are taking place. Mm -hmm. All of these things are taking place, which should send any common sense mind to know that this has been a radical decision. Right, right, right. Because right. for sure, right. if you right. make this move, right. you will die. But then if, if you analyze um, um, Dr. King and the people around them, uh, uh, and, and let me preface this, um, uh, Emmett Till and I um, share a birthday, uh, July 25th. Um, um, Cole is July 21st, folks. Right, right, right. But she's an old lady. Um, she's Emmett Till's. You're older than Emmett Till. <laughs> uh, but um, um, if, if you analyze the people that were around Dr. King, 
and Dr. King himself. Um, these were radical people. You know, one of, the, one of the things that separates the civil rights movement, the civil rights era, from a lot of activists of today is that uh, uh, people in the civil rights era drew up strategies designed to benefit the masses of people Amen. and went through those irrespective of what came at them. Uh, activists today are more relegated to the, 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 the rhetorical rant of speaking truth to power. But we lack the, the, the strategic mindset of, of the civil rights era in a lot of ways. I mean, whatever was necessary, whatever face you needed to get us from point A to point B, they accepted. And when you look at Rosa, Fo uh, Rosa Parks, she was, she was, you know, I mean, they have broken Rosa Parks down to some old lady with bad feet. Um, well, that's by not no Rosa means. Pa that's not Rosa Parks. No. You know. Um, More um, radical than King. Rosa Parks correct. stood on the left. Correct. Rosa Parks was with unions. Correct. Who were on the left. Correct. 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 Because remember, A. Philip Randolph in 1941, when the war breaks out, informs Roosevelt that if he can't give blacks 2% of those federal jobs. Right. Right. He put 50,000 people in, in, in Washington. Right, and right. Roosevelt said, okay, I set up Fair Employment Practice <laughs> Commission, FEPC. Right. right. So there's radical beginnings here, and right. this sister is a part of that thinking because right. she's working with those Brotherhood of Sleeping Car right. Brothers, and, you know, right. this, is, this is her right. beginnings. Right. But she also stood very strong on women. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Always right. had. Right, right, right. I always right. say she, 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 she came into her 18th year right. as right. Harriet is escaping yeah. and Ida B. Wells is going home. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> all know? of these people had yes. um, definite strategies yes. of changing circumstance, of, of, of allowing you to think what you did about them, but they were committed and focused on changing circumstance. It wasn't just like uh, being symbolic leaders. When you no. look at it, they were uh, intent upon changing Jim Crow, about desegrega uh, desegregating the bus system, about, uh, 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 well, desegregating America, mm -hmm. about uh, uh, education, about opportunity for employment. These are tangible things that require strategy, you know. Um, um, so the fact that we didn't see them as radicals, I mean, if we had taken a good hard look <laughs> at who they were and what they were trying to do, and what they we had to figure it out. And what they had to face. And, well, and right, and correct, yeah. correct, correct, correct. Well, the implementation mm -hmm. of strategy mm -hmm. led to a process that mm -hmm. eventually led Martin Luther King mm -hmm. to challenge the very basis of mm -hmm. our economic system. Right. Yes. So uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do we mean by the implementation of strategy? In Montgomery, the strategy was that we needed to be our own liberators. Right. And so rather than having uh, uh, enlightened Negroes in high places, mm -hmm. uh, essentially produce liberation for the majority of African Americans, Martin Luther King and others argued that no, we needed to take the streets and destroy Jim right, Crow right. Uh, for ourselves. Right. That captured the imagination of uh, a generation in Montgomery right. to see that for one year, for one entire year, black people decided to walk rather amazing. than ride that was the amazing. buses. That was amazing. And we shut it down. Right. That captured right. the imagination right. um, of, of the young people. Right. Now, yeah, of everybody. You know, we got Sister, uh, sister um, Mayor Bell, right. the woman, if you see the picture, she's carrying baskets of sandwiches on her head with right. food and stuff so right. she can serve the marchers. Other people are bringing water. Right. Other people are just bringing a salute. I'm so glad you're out here, you know? Right. Uh, it was at a moment. Others are coming by with a ride. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they carpooled. Mm -hmm. All of these things are happening. So it brought to it unified a right. community. Mm -hmm. But Johanna, I lived in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And when that girl took the bus, that seat, and I heard it, I set right. up. Right. This is a way of doing right. something. Right. And right. so right. this was true across the South. Right. People were sitting up. Right. And so what would happen is we right. saw Montgomery as the model. Mm -hmm. A model right. for change, a model for doing it, right. 
and the courage, the commitment through bombings and clans right, and, and the right, white citizens right, council, right, the most dangerous thing right. in the nation, they did not retreat. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Talk on, about uh, it in relation to, on to, to this on this journey of, of transformation and walking the cross, as Sister Colia mentioned earlier, there's a brilliant book uh, which are testimonies of this period by veteran civil rights activists called They Should Have Served That Cup of Coffee. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> they... Right. Because and they added a sandwich uh, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should have served that couple. And of not coffee. do what they did in Knoxville, right. Tennessee, when Dr. Right. Got, Dr. Right. King got killed in Knoxville. Right. They were going to try to capture right. the young black youth, so they right. called them all in, and they barbecued steak. Right. So they wouldn't riot because there were 342 cities burning. <laughs> Soon as the kids got to eat, they burned the town. Right. Jack, Jack O'Dell said. They should have given him anything but that state. Right, right, right. <laughs> Give us a no, I hear you, I hear you. Well, well by 1963, um, Martin Luther King and others had identified what came to be known as the package deal, which is that black people in Birmingham now needed to fight not just to be served in a restaurant, mm -hmm. but we needed health care and education mm -hmm. and jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's what really brings us to the March on Washington. And we can talk about this journey and path mm -hmm. of fighting right. for justice right. in all of its complexity. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the individuals who are oh, going to be joining us. Before we do, let me just say a few words you, about Edgar Evers, because there are two cities in 63. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We focus on Birmingham, but they are parallel movements happening at the same hour. Jackson, Mississippi, but there's many in jail, if not more. Same age group from five up, mm -hmm. all five years old age of New mm -hmm. York up, of youth mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both on the same path, both with the same model. That mm -hmm. we want an upgrade and we want to be employed first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want to be upgraded in employment. To, uh, we don't want to just come in and be your janitor. We also want to be your managers right. for these stores. Right. And of right. course, Jackson also had a boycott, the most successful in the United States, in terms of its impact. Birmingham and other places that had boycotts, the city's downtown area still stand. Because Medgar Evers 50 years ago was killed down because of downtown Jackson, mm -hmm. trying to desegregate it. Jackson's downtown has not reopened. You don't go down there and worry about whether or not you can put on a hat. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about whether or not you can try on some shoes because it's not there. Those stores are gone. And the only thing you get downtown are cultural centers mm -hmm. uh, and business districts, hotel, Everett Lee is still there. In fact, I stated in February, I was surprised they put me in Everett Lee. I was like, oh no, I didn't put me down here, did they? But anyway, so. Jackson was closed. Mm -hmm. So we have the two mm -hmm. parallel movements, and we must remember to tell the world that because in one of these movements, the brother will be assassinated. Medgar right. will die right. at Jackson. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, a, it's, a, right. it's a powerful moment and another evolution in the movement. Right. Um, I like to tell my students that as uh, important as Martin Luther King was, mm -hmm. he didn't make the movement. No, he did not. Oh, no. The movement, no, the no, movement no. was a coming. Right, right. And it had so much to do with uh, the migration right. of African Americans from uh, rural centers to urban centers, both in the South right. and in the North. Right. It was a hurricane of, uh, of movement right. that really. Uh, gave black people a sense of their right. power in numbers in urban centers. Right. In urban centers, the, the KKK right. Right. had right. no snowball's chance in hell to survive. Right. Right. Uh, in rural centers, right. the uh, rural areas, the KKK um, had somewhat more power because right. people were isolated and atomized. So it's this, this movement of black people to the cities that really gives rise um, to the civil rights movement. But we are going to talk about the real MLK right. in his unsanitized right. reality at this event uh, on April 4th. Now, now um, um, I want you to talk about uh, uh, April 4th and the guests.
And I'm going to come back to what you're saying because uh, in a lot of ways, I'm just like a little boy with his nose pressed up against the candy store. And, <laughs> you know, listening to you, I could, I could do this forever. Um, but you're going to have, uh, um, uh, Coley is going to uh, be one of the speakers. Also, I think Ramsey Clark, uh, uh, Sonia well, Sanchez. Well, my attorney general, so they'll um, know who, who um, Tell me some of the people who, uh, tell me about the event itself. So, um, the event will begin with veterans of the civil rights movement right. who work closely right. with King. And those veterans include Sister Colia Clark, uh, ben Cheney. Mm, um, right, from uh, Goodman, who, uh, uh, Schwerner and Cheney, who were, uh, exactly. this is amazing. You need to come out to this event. This is gonna be an amazing event. You might not ever have this opportunity again. This is an extraordinary. And Ben Cheney, as you suggested, is the brother, the brother. of James uh, Cheney. We're going to have um, Ramsey Clark mm -hmm. uh, and Jamal Joseph in Nine. that first part of the program, Nine. which is going to be a narrative wow. of the people who decided to make the commitment alongside of King Nine. in uh, in the movement Nine. and the transformation Nine. that they themselves underwent and their recollections Nine. of the transformation that Martin Luther King himself Nine. underwent. And then we are going... No, 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 let me interject that. David Dennis. Mm. Oh, David Nine. Dennis. Uh, one of the original Freedom Riders and mm. on the second wow. phase of the Freedom yeah. Riders oh, also, uh, he was uh, the Congress of Racial Equalities. Right. Now, I'm right. from the Student right. Coordinating right. Committee in Medgar, but right. David was uh, the Congress of Racial Equalities Field Secretary for the mm. state of Mississippi. Mm. Mm. And he's, he's been through more than we can dream, but he will be here. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes th that's quite important. I, I think you mentioned something earlier that's important, which is that this is probably a historic event because right. these voices right. Right. Are, are not young. Are not young. Yeah. Are not right. young. Yeah. And we what do you mean we're not young? Well, well we're I mean, young in spirit. <laughs> um, and you're young in ideas, <laughs> and you're, uh, 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 I mean, you're far younger than most of the young people I know because a lot of the younger younger activists, I'm not even sure if that's the right term, um, but they seem to repeat an illusion of something that happened over and over and over and over again. And when you talk about um, people like Medgar and, 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 and you know, all the people that you mentioned. Martin. These, these were evolutionary, not, mm, just revolutionary, not just revolutionary, but evolutionary, evolutionary. minds. They, um, they continue to grow and, and change according to circumstances that came at them. Um, I can't imagine Malcolm saying the same things that he said in 65 mm -hmm. today. I can't imagine that of Martin. I can't imagine that of Marcus. I can't, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey. I can't imagine um, that of any true revolutionary leader because, you know, it is strategy and you change your strategy as circumstances change. Yes, true. Um, um, but um, all, the, all of the people you mentioned were just extraordinary. And um, when, you, when you mentioned people like Jamal Joseph, mm. um, you see that it required, the, the movement itself not only required uh, fortitude in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the face of extraordinary um, circumstances, mm -hmm. you know. But it required that generationally from the, the oldest to the youngest, everyone had to play their the position. Role. You know, they had to like yes. stick together and play their position. So the movement, the, the leaders of the movement were extraordinary, the followers of the movement were extraordinary, the fact that they all held their position in the wake of, of uh, Abominations. I mean, what was done to uh, to uh, uh, James Cheney um, mm. um, was just. Uh, I mean, it it would like take the heart out of ninety nine percent of the people. What was done to Emmett Till would would oh, call mm -hmm. you know um, the bombing that of those mother, little girls. Such a powerful um, mother. He had such a powerful mother. Right. Right. To be able to let the right, world see what right, they did right, to her son. Right. Just in, just incredible, yes. incredible people, and we don't face that. By and, and, and large, and, and I wanted know, to say to Johanna, uh, it is true that this, the, the 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 migration movement is having an impact both internally in the South and externally to the North. But our work in Mississippi and in Alabama was in the rural areas, mm -hmm. and those right. rural areas mm -hmm. where the people remained, right, right, we got the right. Fannie Lou Hamer. You had a better, you'd had oh a better God, chance against the Wolfman and, and Dracula. Not the Nixon's, but. 
C.C. Bryant's, and we could, right. I just could go across right. Uh, right. Uh, down at my, Mrs. Borenton, we didn't believe, down in Selma, Alabama, her right. and her husband who passed away while we were there. Uh, it, we, we organized both rural and urban. We see the, the, the urban because of the fires. Mm -hmm. Right. But right. the burning spirit mm -hmm. that made the critical changes will come out of the countryside mm -hmm. itself. Right out there in the cotton fields, the cane fields, mm. the corn fields, in the little small towns, uh, the mix of people. You'll have somebody who uh, was running liquor and a friend of the sheriff. Right, right. But when we come, right. we'll go through a revolutionary change right. and say, you right. know, sheriff, right. Right. either you with my right. folk or you don't get no more liquor. Right, mm -hmm. right. And work with us right. at Macomb, Mississippi. And that, mm -hmm. that is extraordinary. Brothers who, well, you know, what do you call them up? Right. The men will give the money out. And right. There's a word for it up north. <laughs> oh, some, loan shots. Uh, yeah, loan shots. Right, the loan right, shot right. brothers will, will be out. Yeah, I know them mm -hmm. words. And they'll yeah. be on the side <laughs> of the struggle. I saw right. it with Stephen Biko in South Africa, if you see right. the film, mm -hmm. that the unusual uh, becomes the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. these were people that we looked down on. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden, they were the ones that stepped up to the plate rather than the businessmen that we looked right. up to. Right, right. Yeah, right, so, yeah, right. so it's, a, it's a marriage of the right. two. Mm -hmm. right. The marriage of the right. two that makes for yeah. the powerful struggle right. in the South. But in terms of right. the North, it is going, the people who take it to the streets are going to be uh, those people who ride in these urban centers with right. a match. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they got no money, but I got right. a match. Okay. Right. And I can use it. Right. Absolutely. I want to uh, just say that we want to put these veteran civil rights activists in conversation with newer voices today yes. mm. who are in the that streets so old, yeah. fighting around a spectrum right. of issues. So we right. will have Reverend C.D. Witherspoon mm -hmm. from Baltimore wow. participate in this conversation. Right. And I know that he's about to launch right. Uh, another poor people's movement. All right, I think we have a call. We're going to, um, I'll oh, let you finish your oh, thought. And if we do have a call, I can put the call through. We but, will uh, have I Irma finish. Bahar um, of the Audrey Lord Project participate in this conversation and Wright, mm -hmm. who's a U.S. Army colonel mm -hmm. who took a stand wow. against right, the Iraq right, war. Right. She was the highest. Uh, yes. Uh, Right, yes. right, and correct, the Iraq, uh, Iraqi and uh, Afghani wars, she That's took right. a stand yes. in it, right. Reverend, Extraordinary. Reverend Extraordinary. Graylin Hagler Extraordinary. of um, Washington, D.C. Right. Uh, will uh, be giving uh, us the final sermon. We right. will also have Victor Toro right, there. Reverend Hagler is a liberation right. theologist preacher. Right, yes. right, right. Go ahead, you know, I talk. used to be the only kind I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put the call through uh, uh, um, if you can like uh, figure it out if, if we haven't lost it because I'm like... Uh, so Victor Toro, while we get the, the call, Victor Toro, who will be speaking on the crisis of immigration, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, there will be other voices, performances by Sonia Sanchez, Immortal Technique. Right, right. Yes. right. Immortal right. Technique right. will be performing as well. I forgot about that one, that's right. Um, and we will also have an Iranian brother, yes. Hosan, wow. who will be um, performing uh, and singing at the event. We shall overcome. Right, right, right. That's another thing that, uh, that uh, we overlook, uh, time has taught us to overlook, um, the fact that we were so, um, that everyone played their part. The artist community played, played their, their part. part. When, when, Amen. You know, I hear Coley. Um, Coley didn't need this. Coley could have, Coley has a beautiful voice. She <laughs> hey, but I wasn't a musician. We had all yeah. of those beautiful snick singers and, and all of those individuals, a little girl that did the piece at, at Dr. King's Church. Why don't we take the call? I, yeah, I if they have the call, put the call through. I see him pressing buttons, so hopefully it'll, it'll pop Hello? up there. Hi, how you doing, Coley? Uh, well, I'm doing real good after watching your show now. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. So, Brother Matt, once again, um, exceptional programming, brother. Um, I want to say hello to the Queens. Hello, you know, hello. Was, <laughs> hello? Hello? <laughs> uh, hello? Yeah, we hear you, we hear you. We All hear right, you. I was, oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I was like listening to y'all drop these names you know, of 
um, I, I don't even know what to call them because, you know, like when I think of the fear factor of knowing that they were people that will actually stretch her neck right. or attending something, you yeah. know, things like that. You know, I it's like the, the courageous spirit that they had is because I know like living in New York and I've seen how people in the community were scared to go by um, Occupy Wall Street. Right. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Even right. to drop the can or whatever. It may right. not have been a totally black thing, right. but it was something. You know what I'm saying? That um right. speak against the right. evils that we long been suffering. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, wow, you know, people have changed and black folk like this always want to refer to as ancient history and now right. it's now. But you know that old saying so much has changed and so much has stayed the same. You know what I mean? Right, 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 right. right. And I'm like, wow, you know, and I, I see the Queen Koya here. You know what I'm saying? Her wealth of experiences and whatnot. Oh. Um, I met this sister, um, Dorothy Cotton and whatnot. Hey, man, like, brother. <laughs> Dr. Kings. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I'm like, wow, you know, you kind of remind me of her and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, you know, it's a beautiful thing to still know that we have survivors from the past. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. You know what I'm saying? But we still have to make other pioneers because we still got to, like, keep this fight going. You know what I'm saying? It's just so much more sublime. People think it's over, but it's not. Right. There's a reason why all this happens to us. And I'm just glad that y'all out here making it known. Thank you, know you brother. And out here with, with, with the next generation. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna you allow know? them. I'm gonna see if we have another call. If not, I'm gonna allow them to uh, to uh, speak. I'm not sure. Um, um, kind of started late because I had a long roll in and whatnot. I wanted to sort of set the mood. Um, um, but uh, 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 thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your input. It's it's like no doubt, brother. Um, Y'all have a um, good one. He Thank said you. something that was um, very accurate about um, Occupy Wall Street and the, and the threat of violence. Uh, he said, stretch your neck. Stretch your neck was almost like uh, uh, PG-13 compared to some of the things that they were doing to, to people who were involved in, in, in the movement. And um, um, if you want to say that Occupy Wall Street uh, was not a black thing, um, then you're only talking about um, a lot of the people who were down there, but in point of fact, economics affects black and brown people more than anyone else. Mm. And 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 uh, when they had the transcripts from Wells Fargo mm. of uh, of uh, the the Foreclosure. reverse right the reverse yeah. redlining thing, black and brown people um, they steered black and brown people to what they referred to in their emails as ghetto loans for mm. mud people irrespective of whether or not you qualified for a prime loan. So um, um, don't get it twisted. Uh, the issues yeah, the itself had more to do yeah. with black and brown people than anyone else. The mass foreclosures was the like steered toward mm -hmm. black and brown people. The mass unemployment right, right. is still black and right, brown. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, um, and the mass unemployment is still black and brown, you know. And, and the economic disparity is still black and brown. And the educational disparity is still black and, and brown. And the jail system. And, and the jail system, right. you know. Um, but, um, uh, well, you know how to tell you, in your work, I'd love to hear her speak because mm. I think this young woman has really begun the new process of re-radicalizing education. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I went to a program where she was one of the sponsors of right. that at the Burr Manhattan Community College uh, with Mumia Abu Jamal, um, well, about Mumia yeah. Abu Jamal and, yeah. and the Incarceration the Education Nation. Uh, but let us talk a, a, a little bit about how you see, you know, Dr. King and, 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 and Vietnam was what this, mm -hmm. that's why people consider him radical because he was now right, speaking on right, Vietnam. Right, right, but he right. also in here will talk about Peru, right. he will talk about Honduras, he will talk right. about South Africa, right. he will talk about the other places in the right. world, both East and West. Right. And he very carefully balanced right. them, as yeah, I recall, the, yeah, the in, in his speech. In the speech, yes. Him, yeah. They were all, we all said yeah, Vietnam, yeah, yeah, but yeah. he had all of them in the speech. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> Can you, can you talk a bit about that in terms of what that means for the young people who are watching today? <coughs> well, by the end of his life, uh, Martin Luther King, in this speech, was condemning what he called, quote, militarism, racism, 
and extreme right. materialism. Right. By the end of his life, he was asking the question, who owns the iron ore? Why must we pay water bills in a world that's made up of water? Right. The, I'm quoting Martin Luther King, right. yes, not yes, verbatim. Right. Uh, so essentially, the Martin Luther King that we do not read about in our textbooks was a Martin Luther King who had understood that in order to move forward toward freedom, we had to question a system that, quote, produces beggars. Right. And that system remains with us today. Right. And that is why inequality right. and injustice and economic stratification is with us today. And those are the questions that have been uh, put forth to a new generation of uh, activists today who are out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there are mm -hmm, plenty of mm -hmm. young people Correct. who are out there oh, yes. you who, who want to. I came to a place, y'all had it packed, a whole auditorium right, packed with right, young people, right. lined up outside to go through that security system which bugged me to get in. Right. But, but, in know, order, yeah. but in order, what we see from history is that in order for people to fight mm -hmm. in the streets, mm -hmm. they have to have a sense that we can win. Right. And so these models of protest are very important, like Montgomery. Mm. Quite frankly, like the Occupy protests, which ultimately capture the imagination of people and give people a sense that together we can launch a fight back yes. and win. Our Pam Africa and the development of a major international movement around a political prisoner. Right. She right. is such a powerful and wonderful right. woman that whenever I say I want to cry, because she has been out there, her, her people bombed and killed, 11, 11 dead, and, and yet she's able to get up. Uh, both of them, and, and Ramona. And Ramona, is, is, yeah, get me uh, there, yeah. Both, uh, but um, you talk about we can win. Uh, part, of, part of being able to win is to endure the race. Mm. And, and good Lord, we only got a minute left. I can't believe yeah. it. Um, um, <laughs> Quickly, uh, tell us about this one last time. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, Thursday, April 4th, 2013. Mm. Phenomenal program at the Riverside Church honoring the radical MLK. Mm. It is the place where everyone who wants to answer the question, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Which was a question that Martin Luther King asked. Mm. Uh, everyone who wants to answer that question must be at this event. Thursday, April the 4th at 7 p.m. at the Riverside Church. Thursday, April 4th, Riverside Church, 7 p.m. Uh, we'll see you next week. Go to this event. It is history uh, today. I'll, I'll see you next week. Whoa.